Christoph Becherer, and he is also now the, the next uh, speaker. And uh, he will give an overview of the research networks pooling exhibit. So, morning. <laughs> So, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much to the organizers of this uh, very beautiful workshop <coughs> for the opportunity to present our, our network here. Um, it's called Extending Links in Quantum Networks, and uh, the abbreviation is QLINKX. I'm uh, the speaker of this network, and I'm from Saarland University in Saarbrücken, Germany. Um, let's start. So the goal of many of us that are joining this workshop is quantum communication and quantum networks. And we want what we want to do is to distribute quantum states within the network as a resource for secure communication. Uh, but also we want to use these quantum networks, for example, for distributed quantum computing or distributed quantum sensing. And um, I'm assuming here as a, as a start that most of you are familiar with some basic uh, ideas of quantum communication, such as quantum key distribution, where two parties exchange photons to establish a common key that they can use for encryption of secret messages. Um, I'm not going into the details of this anymore, um, but I'm trying to give you an idea how a quantum repeater works. Again, I'm not uh, absolutely sure um, about the, the audience that we have here today. So I'm going to explain a little bit how a quantum repeater works, which is the goal of our research network. But let's start first with just uh, classical long distance optical communication. Um, you could do this free space. Some people are doing optical communication uh, to satellites, for example. Um, most of optical communication, however, is happening in fiber networks. And this communication and the uh, bandwidth of this communication is limited by transmission losses in optical fibers. Many of you might have seen this graph here before. Um, this is the basic roadblock for optical communication. This is the, the transmission through an optical fiber. This is the best fiber that we have, so-called SNF28 fibers. <coughs> and uh, what you see here is the attenuation coefficient on a logarithmic scale as a function of the wavelength of the light that we use for the communication. Where are two standard telecommunication bands called the telecom O band. This is around here at, at uh, 13 10 nanometers. And the second band, the telecom C band, around 15 50 nanometers. This is uh, the, the latter one, is where optical fibers have the smallest uh, absorption losses. Telecom O band is where optical fibers have uh, least dispersion. There's a third band marked with that yellow arrow here, uh, around 80, 50, 8, 50 nanometers. Um, this is typically used for data traffic in data centers, short range communication. Um, let's take a look <coughs> at these transmission losses at the best possible wavelength that we have. Again, 15, 50 nanometers. Logarithmic losses are 0.2 dB per kilometer. And if you uh, need or want a uh, kind of graphic number, then the transmission after 100 kilometer at this optimum wavelength is just 1% of the initial signal. If you go to the second band, the O band, uh, losses are slightly larger on the logarithmic scale. However, if you look at the linear transmission, which going down to 0.03%, and if you go to that um, short distance communication band uh, after 100 kilometers, you end up with 10 to the minus 16 percent. So uh, it's very obvious that these losses in optical fibers are limiting the range of communication. And 
this is the reason why classical optical communications uses repeating amplifiers or repeaters. So we see here a photo of a uh, transatlantic fiber cable and uh, every 50 or 100 kilometers or so, you have these black boxes here and these black boxes are repeating amplifiers where you have erbium doped fibers that refresh the signal and refreshing the signal is uh, in a more formal way to uh, measure, a signal, measure a signal and um, reproduce it on a higher intensity level. In uh, quantum communication, we cannot use such a classical repeater because in uh, quantum signals are generally in superposition states or in entangled states. We have that no cloning theory uh, that tells us that you cannot copy a, a quantum state without losses. And that's, uh, that's a classical repeater does not work for refreshing a quantum signal. There are two basic solutions to overcome this problem. The first solution would be to just go to shorter segments for communication and then to concatenate these short segments. This is called a network of trusted nodes. And uh, basically you have a short segment, uh, you have two communication partners, they exchange photons for creating a, uh, a key for uh, secret communication. And at the end of that segment, at the place of these two communication partners, the quantum information becomes classical. Yeah, they, they have that key and to start with a new segment, they have to again uh, transfer the classical information into quantum information. The problem is that at each node, quantum information is converted to classical information and this poses a security risk. You need a so-called trusted node. That means you need to shield this node uh, against um, eavesdropping attacks. Um, this, however, is kind of a technological feasible solution and there has a very beautiful demonstration of such a network of trusted nodes and, uh, in China. Many of you know this. Uh, this is a long network running from Shanghai down here to Beijing up there. Um, it's a 2000 kilometer fiber network with over 700 fiber links. And from Beijing, there's also a link to a satellite bridging another 2,600 kilometers to uh, Nanshan over here. So overall, 4,600 uh, 4, kilometers of a trusted node network. So again, a beautiful demonstration. However, uh, there's the inherent security risk that information is classical at the endpoints of each segment. The second solution to that problem of transmission losses is the quantum repeater. And this uh, machine does not try to mimic the classical repeater, but it's a machine that tries to distribute entangled states between widely separated partners. And these partners may then use the entangled states as a resource for quantum communication. The advantage here is that over the whole distance, uh, quant uh, the information is quantum. So you have an end-to-end -end quantum information. And so here we are at the goal of our research network. What we try to do is to demonstrate an elementary quantum repeater connection. Uh, we want to lay the basis for physically secure communication over large distances and want to go beyond the trusted node model. Um, and what we want to demonstrate is a quantum repeater advantage. That means lower losses than direct point-to-point -point connection. So in this graph here, we have the relative communication rate over a direct link as a function of the distance. The blue line that you see here is the point-to-point -point link and uh, the uh, rate directly scales with the transmission losses So the blue line is more or less the exponential attenuation of the optical signal as a function of the distance. And to overcome this limitation, uh, you need a, a quantum repeater. And we want to cross this blue line. Uh, and you see here the red lines that correspond to 
transmission losses or channel losses of a perfect quantum repeater with one or two nodes. So crossing this line is the major goal of our research network. Um, there's a choice of many physical systems and many physical approaches to realize uh, quantum repeater functionalities. And we made some decisions. We, first of all, focus on fiber-based systems. As I mentioned before, uh, this is a major um, um, hub for uh, long distance communication. We focus on a bottom-up approach. That means we rely on available systems from research labs and from common technology. And we try to develop them to the required level of maturity so that they can be used for quantum repeater demonstrations. We chose several hardware platforms and the criteria are they have to show a quantum memory functionality. We need qubit memory uh, to it or memory photo interfaces. We need entanglement sources. And the hardware platforms that we've chosen are semiconductor quantum dots, trapped atoms and ions, and color centers in diamond. We also develop the theory. Uh, first of all, a realistic model, uh, putting in realistic hardware parameters, uh, but also looking at new protocols for uh, quantum repeaters and also entanglement assisted communication. We start with uh, our demonstration with two simple schemes or units, and I will explain them in detail. We call them quantum repeater segment and a quantum repeater cell. And uh, those two are uh, universal in the sense that a concatenation of these segments and cells allow a scalability. The network, uh, Q-Link X, uh, of which I'm now the speaker, uh, covers 36 academic groups at 21 sites all over Germany. Uh, we have two uh, companies and one Fraunhofer Institute. And as Dieter Meschede already mentioned, uh, we also have an advisory board with members from industry and federal institutions. The two functional units that I already mentioned, um, I'm going to explain now. Um, that the first one is a quantum repeater segment, and this is in literature uh, and in the community well known as entanglement distribution. And uh, this is an elementary operation for every quantum repeater link, and it provides entangled states at the endpoint of a communication line. We um, established a graphic notation, which I'd like to introduce here. So the blue dots that you see here are quantum memories or a quantum, or a quantum bit. Um, the white uh, circle is a photon that can travel along a certain channel. Uh, that purple loop here denotes entanglement. And this little box where two photons can meet, this is a beam splitter. And I, let me walk through uh, this functionality now. Uh, as I don't know again uh, how familiar uh, our um, um, the people in, in this talk are with the basics, let me just go through some uh, basic notations. We have a single qubit state, and uh, we can write it as a general superposition state, uh, for example, alpha times zero plus beta times one. Zero and one are just abstract uh, just quantum states. For a photon, this could be, for example, a horizontal and a vertical polarization. If we want to create entanglement, then there are two basic uh, sources you can create entangled photons. I don't go into detail how you do this. Typically, this is done in a spontaneous parametric process, or, but you can also use semiconductor quantum dots to deterministically create these entangled photons. So we just say we have a source of photons, A and B, and uh, by some means, they are in an entangled state. You can also uh, do a qubit or memory photon entanglement by using uh, selected excitation and decay paths in an atomic or atom-like system. For example, here you 
uh, do some excitation, you have two channels where you can uh, decay and send out a photon. So some property of the photon B uh, will be entangled with some degree of freedom of the internal levels of the atom, um, so for example, a Seaman sublevel or a spin state. And these entangled states um, so for two quantum bits, there are just four options. This is also for Bell state, phi plus minus, where we have, uh, for example, a zero in A and B or a one in A and B and psi plus minus states we, we, where we have kind of mixed states, zero A, one B plus minus one A and zero B. But these are the only four options for two qubit entangled states. The question is now, after we have created this entanglement, how can we distribute it? And for that, we need two entanglement sources. Now, drawn again as uh, photon, photon entanglement sources. So we have entanglement between photos A and B and photons C and D. And we assume for a moment that we prepare uh, th th these two sources in the psi minus states. Question is, can we distribute this entanglement of these two pair further? For that, we need uh, a measurement that is called a Bell state measurement. So photons B and C are sent to a measurement station, which in the end is beam splitter and single photon detectors. And such a Bell state measurement on particles B and C projects the joint quantum state into one of the four possible Bell states of the particles B and C, which are again the four states I mentioned before. Now, how can you um, distribute the entanglement now? And this process is called entanglement swapping, and let's walk through it step by step. We have, uh, assume again, we produce a psi minus state of particles A, B, and C, D. We send particles B and C to the central measurement station, and we can write the common state of all four particles in a Bell state basis. Uh, first of all, we take these two states, psi minus A, B, and psi minus C, D, and just multiply the two brackets, and then you get the joint states of all four particles. And now you can rearrange these four terms and write it as a tensor product. And the tensor product is always in terms of Bell states again. And so these four terms here can be regrouped in four terms as written out here. So this is a few lines of algebra. And now what happens if you do the Bell state measurement on particles B and C? then you will get one of the four results that are highlighted now by the colored boxes. Yeah? One of these four results will turn out. And depending on which result was measured, let's assume for a, minor, uh, for a moment uh, Psi plus BC, then you see that immediately the other two particles, A and D, are projected also into a Bell state. And this is the magic behind entanglement swapping yeah? measurement of the two particles B and C in a Bell basis will automatically project the other two particles A and D, which never interacted into an entangled state. So to sum up, the distribution of entanglement requires generation of entanglement as a first step and entanglement swapping as a second step. So again, uh, you can create two pairs of entangled particles. Here we have like matter and light entanglement. You send two particles to a central measurement station where you do a Bell measurement. And this measurement projects particles A and D into an entangled state. And in that uh, system that we show here, the, partic uh, the yeah, particles A and D, which are, for example, atomic systems, can now store the entanglement. And this stored entanglement can be used as a resource for generating a quantum key, for example. Um, now, this simple scheme that we just showed for four particles can be extended. And we again use our graphic language here. We start with the uh, quantum memory photon entanglement at two sides. We send the photons to the central beam splitter, uh, Bell state measurement. Uh, leads to entanglement swapping. So now the two um, stationary qubits become entangled.
we can extend the step by just putting two of these schemes just behind each other. And now we have to create again local matter light entanglement at each uh, point of a quantum memory or a qubit. Um, we send fo two photons in each segment to the beam splitter. Entanglement swapping now creates entangled states of the material qubits. And now we have to do a Bell state measurement on the two center material qubits. And again, entanglement swapping happens. And now the outer two particles become entangled. And you can see that by just concatenating these steps, you can distribute entanglement over a long chain. And this is the basic idea of a quantum repeater. This looks simple on paper, but it's a quite demanding task. And um, uh, prominent people of our community have realized this early on. So these are Nicolas Chazin and Rob Thu, and in a 2007 Nature Photonics paper, uh, let me quote, they told the development of a fully operational quantum repeater and a realistic quantum network architecture are grand challenges for quantum communication. Despite some claims, nothing like that has been demonstrated so far, and one should not expect any real world demonstration for another five to 10 years. So this was in 2007. Uh, this is something like 14 years uh, before, and uh, after these 14 years, we still do not have a real world demonstration. And I will tell you about some of the experimental difficulties in the following. So um, again, we have these two elementary operations that uh, we first of all need to demonstrate and second, which are required. I had pres presented uh, that segment, which is nothing else than entanglement distribution. And uh, we need a second functionality. And this is something that we call the quantum repeater cell. Again, it's an elementary operation for every repeater link. And together with the segment, it's universal. So that means by concatenating uh, these two units, you can build up arbitrary networks. And let's take a look at that quantum repeater cell. Uh, this is something that we that we stole uh, from Norbert Lütgenhaus's group. Um, he developed a few years ago in this publication here a uh, so-called single sequential quantum repeater, um, and we uh, walk through its functionality. So we need two quantum memories. So the two graphs here are more or less identical. <laughs> We need two quantum memories or two qubits, and we prepare a spin or memory photon entanglement, which with each of the two qubits. And we now send uh, from the left side, we send a photon to a detector. Uh, this is Alice measurement station. She can record that photons, for example, in a BB84 uh, setting, which is a a quantum key distribution setting. And we can repeat this procedure, that generation of uh, memory photon entanglement as, uh, as long as Alice records a photon here and uh, heralds back the success of her measurement. After that, we can do the same on the right-hand side uh, to pre prepare the memory photon entangled states and the photon to Bob. Bob measures the photon heralds back success. And um, after the two communication attempts, we do a Bell state measurement on the two quantum memories. We send uh, classical information to Bob, and he can do a conditional bit flip or a post selection of his results. And this again corresponds to an effective entanglement swapping. Yeah, so the, the only difference is now uh, we can do this even after the two photons have been recorded on the detectors. Uh, the interesting point here is uh, this is called a sequential quantum repeater because uh, in the scheme communication happens first to the left side and after that to the right side, but this doesn't matter. So we can also do that communication attempts at the same time. This extends the communication range by a factor of two. The point is it's not directly scalable as, uh, as this uh, simple scheme, but we can concatenate it as I mentioned with repeater segments and make it scalable. 
Now, why uh, does this improve on the communication distance? We have to talk about the quantum advantage or overcoming the so-called TGW bound. Uh, this is after a paper by Takioka, Guha, and Wilde, um, with, uh, who calculated uh, a bound for direct uh, transmission between two parties over a channel. is also called the repeaterless bound or the clop bound after uh, Stefano Pirandola and, and co-workers and from my uh, limited theoretical knowledge, I would say PLOP and TG rebounds are more or less identical. It is, uh, or it gives uh, the secret key rate over a, lo a lossy channel, and the secret key rate is given in bits per mode per channel use. So it essentially corresponds to the transmittivity of a channel, and this transmittivity after length uh, small l is just uh, limited by the exponential attenuation of the signal and uh, the denominator is the attenuation length, capital M, attenuation. And uh, let's look at the scaling with distance. If you have a direct transmission over uh, a distance L0, then eta of L0, the transmittivity of our channel, uh, will be eta0, and this is just given by e to the minus uh, not over the attenuation length. If we have only half of the um, distance, then eta of uh, L not over two will be just the square root of eta not. Okay. If we look at our quantum repeater segment, and we now use again our graphical language, um, that purple entanglement loop has now been replaced by the two red lines here, which now denote entanglement. So we have uh, two qubits on each side. We produce qubit photon entanglement, send the photons to the central beam splitter. The uh, key rate or transmittivity of each channel will be square root of eta naught. But now we require coincidence. The two photons have to arrive at the beam splitter at the same time. So that they can interfere here and uh, produce that L state measurement. That means the probability for a successful communication attempt will scale as a product of the transmittivity of the two partial segments. So the product of um, square root of eta naught times square root of eta naught, and we end up with eta naught, which is just the transmittivity of a direct communication. So we don't win anything here. No, it's identical to the direct transmission. And the reason is that uh, the total rate scales as a product of independent probabilities. We have to wait for that coincidence. And that gives that uh, kind of no improvement in the scaling. If you look at the single sequential quantum repeater or the quantum repeater cell, however, then we again communicate over half segments, L, uh, not over two. And uh, again, each segment will scale with the square root of eta naught. And now we do not have to rely on coincidences, but because each segment can communicate independently, and we will end up with the sum of the two transmittivities, and this still scales with the square root of eta naught. So we here have now a quadratic gain over the direct transmission. And um, the reason is that we can here use an asynchronous scheme and we do not rely on coincidences. And again, this uh, gain in, uh, in channel uh, capacity uh, brings the quantum repeater advantage that we want to show. And the blue line here can now be identified with that TGW bond. Um, yeah, in our consortium, we uh, do a modeling of uh, quantum repeater links. Um, the details uh, can be looked up in that uh, paper that we published last year. And um, I relied a little bit on Peter von Loog's talk um, to give the details. So I just have a very brief overview here. Um, we model quantum repeater links in a, a very simple model, just using three experimental parameters. And we found that uh, uh, in that simple model, we can just use a so-called link coupling efficiency. That is the efficiency that if you generate 
um, a memory photon entanglement that the photon really arrives in a, a transmission channel, in a communication channel yeah, from that atomic system over collection of the photon to coupling into a fiber. The link coupling efficiency um, sums up everything. Then we have uh, a memory coherence time. That means how fast decoheres the uh, entangled state between the memory and the photon. And we have a clock rate. That means the repetition rate of uh, memory photon entanglement. And we again have that graph where that black line here now represents the repeaterless bound, uh, the gray line up here. This is the uh, perfect uh, quantum repeater link with one node. And the colored lines are now simulations for uh, different hardware platforms. Uh, we see that uh, we have a certain offset from the ideal communication scenario uh, on the right side here. This is given by the link efficiency, now by the finite efficiency to get a photon into a fiber. Um, the slope of uh, these curves is given by the memory efficiency. That means uh, the number of communication attempts that you can do during a coherence time of the memory. And you also see that the slope changes over the distance. That means uh, you can translate that distance into a time. And this is just uh, more or less a defacing time of our memories that leads to a change of the slope over the distance. There's much more to that model, uh, which I cannot present here. Um, we put in, just as a remark, a so-called memory cutoff. That means if the fidelity of the entangled memory photon state becomes too worse, then uh, we just stop the transmission attempt uh, and try it again. And so this is um, to avoid um, that, that we try to communicate with a entangled state that has lost its fidelity. Furthermore, in uh, the theory platform, there's also the development of new protocols. We will hear about this today and also numerical simulations of such quantum repeaters. Um, there's one uh, more detail that we can talk about. Uh, what we discussed so far is a protocol that we call node sense photons. And we have our memory, which send out in photons, which are entangled with the memory to that central beam splitter at the positions of that four red arrows. These photons are sent out. Um, this scheme has one disadvantage. The photons travel to that central beam splitter, to that central measurement station. And from there, the successful detection is heralded back to the memories. And this classical communication back uh, needs time. So there's a waiting time uh, for the classical heralding signal. And this slows down uh, the whole procedure. An alternative would be a protocol called node receives photons. This is very similar to what we have in the upper line here. But in each segment, uh, the central beam splitter is replaced by a entangled photon source. And uh, now this entangled photon source sends out photons to the quantum memories on the left and right sides. And these photons can be either read into the, into the memories or the memories also send out a photon and we have a bell state measurement between the photon from the entangled source and the memory photon. The advantage here is that you can place these measurement stations close to the stationary qubits and there's no waiting for the heralding signals anymore. And this is a perfect method if you have a high repetition rate entangled photon source, um, there's a drawback as usual. The system, unfortunately, is not scalable over um, the scheme that is shown here, because if you scale it further, then you automatically have to introduce the waiting times again. For our experimental realization, there are certain trade-offs that we have to consider. Um, if you look at the memory systems, you have the option of an emissive memory. That means uh, memory emits a photon that is entangled with some internal degree of freedom. 
or an absorptive memory, um, where the second one is much more difficult to realize because absorption cross-section has to be enhanced by large ensembles or by coupling a single center, or a single uh, system to an optical cavity. So the trade-off is also between single quantum systems versus ensembles, and we basically will only use single quantum systems. Another trade-off uh, is for the uh, photon sources, the entangled photon sources here. Um, they can be probabilistic, so that would be the classical SPTC source, that means creating entanglement via spontaneous parametric conversion, um, or you use a more or less deterministic source um, where entanglement is created in a well-defined time window with a high efficiency. And uh, this is what we chosen here um, and using quant uh, semiconductor quantum dots for this purpose. If you can look at the elements and now looking into the experimental uh, realization, um, a quantum repeater segment uh, could be realized by two systems. I put here <coughs> like abstract level schemes into an optical cavity. Uh, the optical cavity is to enhance uh, light matter interaction and to provide a uh, communication channel for the photons. Um, we assume that we have some means to um, emit a photon that is then entangled with some internal degree of freedom of our Cupid systems. And we assume that we can do this uh, synchronously uh, at two sides and send out photons to a central beam splitter and um, a very early protocol for that is a so-called Caprio protocol, where you have weak excitations on both sides. And on average, only one of the systems will emit a photon. And uh, if this photon is regist registered by one of one click on one of the detectors here, then these two systems are projected into an entangled state. So the spin splitter here you, uh, is used as an erasure of the which path information. So in the end, if you have one click on the detectors, you do not, do not know where the photon originated from. Um, Christoph, can I interrupt you again? Yeah. There's a question again. Um, it's uh, why are ensembles are not used in the memory? Can you please explain a bit more about the trade-off? Um, yeah, um, the point is that um, you, um, the interaction of light and a single particle, like a single atom, is uh, usually quite weak if you work in absorption. Yeah, so if you focus a light beam uh, down to, to an atom, um, you have to get a, to a cross-section that is on the order of um, the, the wavelengths of the light, yeah, and uh, this uh, making this absorption deterministic is very difficult. And uh, one option is to enhance the interaction by putting um, your system into a cavity where the light is reflected many times, and um, by uh, kind of repeating the absorption attempts, you increase the absorption cross section, or you use an ensemble. Um, where you have a high density of systems and, um, and thus increase the chance of absorption of your uh, single photon. However, if you have such a huge ensemble, then you typically have so-called inhomogeneous broadening. That means not all members of that ensemble are identical, but have slightly shifted absorption lines. And uh, this again leads to problems. I should mention, of course, that people are using um, atomic ensembles as, as memories. Yeah? They are beautiful experiments. Um, but, um, and and you also, there's also a scheme for uh, creating um, matter light entanglement in such um, ensemble memories. But uh, again, this is a question of choice. And we here opted for the uh, single particle systems. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have to send out two photons to a central beam splitter. The point is, and I mentioned that before, the photons need to be indistinguishable. Yeah, so 
um, you need uh, you mustn't be able to tell where the photon came from now so these two guys have to be identical and in addition you want telecom wavelengths of the two photons for long range communication this leads to a set of requirements um, but that's the first point you need a memory that means your coherence time uh, of uh, entangled state means it needs to be long enough and uh, we talk about milliseconds for uh, communication distance of uh, about 100 kilometers or so uh, you need a quantum system that has a certain level scheme and you need to be able to coherently control um, the transitions in that scheme so that you can emit photons that are entangled with some internal degree of freedom for example uh, spin orientation and uh, you need a photonic channel uh, you need to as i mentioned produce indistinguishable single photons that means you need small homogeneous and inhomogeneous broadenings of your physical systems you need efficient photon collection each of these tasks is uh, uh, difficult in its own and i'm not aware of a single system that fulfills all of these tasks perfectly as i mentioned before um, we want also the photons to uh, be emitted at telecom wavelengths to have uh, uh, so that you can travel in, in optical fibers uh, the problem is that typically the systems that we use here like atoms color centers whatever um, do not emit at telecom wavelengths and for that we need uh, quantum frequency conversion something that my own group is uh, working on and uh, quantum frequency conversion is the art of changing the color of a single photon uh, without uh, modifying any of its other properties um, and so we have for example two quantum memories here the so one and two is called the, the red and blue color that just symbolizes that they're emitting at different frequencies and quantum frequency conversion turns the photons into identical photons at a telecom wavelength so that they can interfere at a beam splitter so this enables transduction of the system wavelength of our quantum memory here to the telecom bands and i guess i don't have time today to talk about this in more detail yeah um as I mentioned, uh, we have different hardware platforms. We need to realize certain components like spin photon entanglement, quantum memories, quantum gates, efficient readout, efficient photon collection. We need to show entanglement distribution over telecom fiber channels. Our three platforms are neutral atoms and ions, um, which have a very high and unprecedented level of control over the internal degree of freedom. Um, if you look for a disadvantage, then probably uh, they have a small clock rate. Color centers in diamond can potentially have long coherence times. At the moment, their uh, coupling efficiency uh, is quite small and we're working hard on improving this. And uh, third, we have semiconductor quantum dots, which can provide uh, very high clock rates up to the gigahertz range, but on the other hand, they have typically short coherence times. So we have pros and cons for each of the platforms, and this is the reason why we're investigating them all. Um, just a few highlights uh, of uh, recent achievements in, in the consortium. I'm not going into details here because you will hear uh, this in several presentations today. Uh, we have uh, demonstrated spin telecom photon entanglement with single rubidium atoms and single calcium ions. Um, both using quantum frequency conversion, both over 20 kilometers of fiber. Uh, there's a beautiful experiment uh, going on in Harald Einfurter's lab at the moment, and I'm sure he will report about this uh, later on, on atom-atom entanglement, again, over a wire telecom photons. Um, here is a graph with some recent results. Um, so the latest progress is that uh, we can get atom-atom entanglement with telecom photons over 22 kilometers of fiber. Uh, the semiconductor quantum dot community has demonstrated photonic entanglement swapping as an essential ingredient. And there's further work on enemy centers, silicon vacancy centers, and also uh, telecom single photon sources. Um, for the quantum repeater cell, um, there's beautiful work on rubidium single atom quantum memory and crossed fiber cavities. So what you see here, is a 
cavity made out of uh, small mirrors imprinted on the front face of optical fibers. And there's the second fiber, that little white dot in the center here is a single uh, trapped rubidium atom. And you can use these two cavities as, for example, a signal and control channel for the uh, quantum memory. Uh, you can also place uh, many, uh, two or more atoms into such a uh, cavity system and use this as a random access quantum memory. Further work uh, for uh, towards uh, quantum memories and gates, which are used for the quantum repeater cell, is uh, using NB centers as nuclear spin memory and realizing efficient spin photon interfaces for color centers, and also working on quantum dot molecules, which are suitable as a uh, quantum dot quantum memory. The challenge that we face is uh, to get out of the lab. Yeah? So most of the experiments, and this is a few of Jürgen Eschner's uh, lab in Saarbrücken, um, most of our experiments have happened in, in labs because it's very difficult to shield the quantum systems from the environmental influences that lead to decoherence of the created quantum states. But uh, what we need to do is to demonstrate that we are able to communicate over deployed fiber networks. So that means we need to get out of the lab. Uh, first steps have been taken in, in Munich. As I mentioned, Harald Weinfurt has two labs which are 400 meters apart and connected by via optical fibers and uh, atom atom entanglement has been demonstrated. The challenge now is how to turn lab experiments into, into modules and at the same time, of course, keep all the key performance parameters and uh, I show you here an example of an, another BNBF project called OptiClock, where an uh, atomic clock has been put into two rack systems. This is uh, what we are trying to do as well. Yeah, um, as an outlook, where are we going? Um, we are working on a roadmap of, towards a scalable quantum repeater. Um, we, as I mentioned, need to demonstrate a quantum repeater link, and we do this by combining the elementary building blocks, so the quantum repeater segment and the quantum repeater cell. And we start from uh, two end nodes, uh, and then the future would be to go over links with intermediate nodes to more complex network topologies. Um, we need to demonstrate a quantum repeater link outside the lab on a deployed fiber network. We need to, for that, uh, need to develop optimized hardware components and optimizing means efficiency, fidelity, storage times. We need to go from bulk components to modules and our vision is that 19 inch rack where all the experiments fit in in the end. Um, we, after these simple demonstrations, we of course need to go to more advanced concepts like uh, quantum error correction that would enable uh, quantum repeaters of the second generation, uh, entanglement purification, multiplexing of channels to increase the rates. We also need to develop advanced protocols. That means um, how can we get a can we can we make most of our resources under realistic boundary conditions? Uh, for example, error rates um, by the transmission over fiber channels, hardware errors, whatever. How can we uh, com communicate in public networks. Again, I guess we will hear about that later on today. And of course, we're thinking of next generation quantum repeaters, for example, the so called third generation or photonic one way quantum repeater, where you create uh, photonic uh, or large uh, photonic entangled states as a resource and do the communication by measurements on these uh, uh, large photonic states. Um, I guess my time is more or less over. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Peter's talk is not today, so you have enough time. If you still have something, you can tell us. Otherwise, we have a lot of time now for discussions. Okay. Um, if you oh, probably we can um, answer some some first questions right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, first, first, thank you for, for this nice talk and also uh, with some tutorial uh, in it. I think it includes also some parts which 
Peter have in it, uh, had in his talk. Um, so if there are any questions, you are free to ask now. So let's see if there are questions. Otherwise, perhaps I can start also with our standard question. So you, you uh, concerning it's a little bit more related to the title of our workshop. The first question is, what do you think will be the first case for entanglement assisted communication networks? The first case. The first case. Uh, from, a very, from a very pragmatic point of view, I would say um, uh, this will be for the one who pays most for his uh, security. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, everything that we do is just a matter of um, what are you ready to invest for security of your communication. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are many people saying classical um, encryption is good enough for, for most purposes, yeah. But um, but there's also in, uh, not enough of hacking. We read this in the newspaper every day. So um, if you have to protect critical infrastructure, for example, uh, then this is probably the first use case where the federal state could go ahead and say, uh, let's try quantum networks as a protective measure for, um, for our critical infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, um, I hear that uh, many um, providers for, for example, data center infrastructure are now being asked uh, whether their infrastructure is uh, quantum proof Uh, uh, ready for uh, or, or resistant for attacks uh, with with quantum computers. Yeah, so there might be also a push from from the market side. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The second question before I come from to the question from the audience is: uh, You already answered it partly in your talk. It's on the path of realization. Uh, this use case, what is the current main challenge in your field? Yeah, so I'm, I'm an experimentalist, and for us, the uh, biggest challenge is to get out of the lab. Yeah. As I mentioned, um, so typically uh, on the lab table, we have a lot of bulk components, we have stabilized lasers, we have uh, vacuum chambers or cryostats uh, to cool down samples to temperatures close to the absolute zero point. Um, and all of that has to be packed into, into modules, has to be packed into a rack and moved to a, um, a location where you have access to a deployed fiber network. Yeah? For example, move to a data center. Yeah? And uh, I would say this is a huge challenge and there are many Uh, technical, but also principal problems that, that we have to face here. So uh, enough work for many years to come. Mm 